Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and uh, it's very nice, very nice to be here. I'm assuming this thing is is right. Um, that's me. Um, so I work at UCL, and as um, as was said, I I am very very interested in how people and the environment actually interact and what that actually means, um, in both in terms of um, what happens inside people. So and what happens inside the environment. So in order to understand the one, we need to understand the other. So that's sort of basically um, what, my, uh, what my approach is. I'm going to describe a little bit this afternoon about how we do that and some of the consequences. Um, one of the sort of interesting things uh, I always think is that when you see, when you, people talk about cities and you see um, a picture of a city, often it looks a bit like one of those. I mean, it's sort of taken from some view that you may or may not be able to actually to be at. Um, and the idea is you see this very grand uh, sort of scenario, whether it's Mexico or Sydney or Singapore. Um, it's a very sort of uh, overarching big thing. Um, but actually, uh, that's not, to me, that is not really what a city is. A city actually, for me, is the people. And we sort of build stuff around people and what they want to do and how we actually facilitate that. And so I got very interested in... in um, Edward Hall's stuff around his perception of space. So my sort of thinking really was about how do we actually design a city? Instead of thinking of the city as this big thing and we start to think down how do we design in more and more detailed ways, why don't we start thinking about the people and the interactions we want between the people and then design up towards the, the sort of scale of a, of a city? And so it's quite interesting to think about the, the work that this was done in the 1960s. Um, about how people perceive space. So he had this sort of concept that um, he worked in feet, of course, but about eight metres away, that sort of distance, uh, what he called public space, was when you're beginning to be able to see that there's somebody there that you um, might or might not be able to recognise, but you're in a sort of sense of being in the same space as them. If they're further away, they feel very remote. If they're nearer to it, it starts to change a bit towards something which he called more social. So social space was about um, the sort of distances that you might have conversations with somebody. So um, you probably aren't going to go much beyond maybe three metres to have a conversation with somebody. That's quite a long way to project a voice, for example. Um, so, and as that gradually becomes smaller, you get down to the sort of space where two people will have a conversation. So, for example... Um, very different example, a string quartet. I mean, you basically, you can take in three people in the string quartet. It's quite hard to take pe four people in a string quintet. And that is sort of how that sort of interaction actually works because of the, the angle of your um, foveal vision and the way that your eyes work and all that sort of stuff means that these things become easier. And the same sort of thing applies in the street. So how you have a conversation with one person, how you have a conversation with two or three is something to do with... Um, the space that you have available to you, and that sort of sits in that social space. If you go much smaller than that, it gets to be quite personal, and you're starting to sort of uh, get quite... You wouldn't want to be that close to people um, unless you sort of kind of had to, or you knew them quite well. And, of course, less than that, it, it goes even more. So he had this sort of idea of public, social, personal space, and um, Gail um, picked that up, and uh, he, he illustrated this sort of point. So you see... Um, the girl over here, a long, long way away, allegedly 100 metres away, um, and on the, far, on the far right side, it's much, 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 much closer. And he, really the sort of social space, public space and personal space are sort of in there somewhere, and you can translate that down into that sort of space. So if you want to design a piece of, a piece of space for people to be social or personal, that's the sort of scale that you're really talking about. And that means that you have... Um, different sort of approach to what that space might look like. So a, a square in the world that I, I, I quite like is, the, is the, the Cathedral Square in Havana, for example, which is actually quite a small square. Um, and it's very much a sort of personal type square. People sort of sit at it and they, they chat and they do stuff because actually it's only about 30 metres across. It's quite small. If you compare that, say, with Trafalgar Square, which is a grand state sort of square, it's doing a different function, doing different sort of stuff, but it's not a particularly personal place. And what we're sort of thinking about is if we were to look at designing things this way around, we would start to look at 
Um, maybe a different way of perceiving how we do it. So the first thing is um, the personal social space is sort of about how people uh, work together and interact with each other on a kind of individual or small number basis. And the public space is where they sort of do that en masse. So when we work with tube stations or when we work with um, big town squares and things like that, that's what we're talking about. And so, and, and to what extent are people en masse some sort of summation of lots of individual people? Or is the way that people interact individually to each other somehow amplified or absorbed by the way that they act when in a larger uh, quantity of people? Um, the one can inform the other. So how do we do that? Well, we, we think about um, these sort of things by thinking about how people and the environment interact. And we, we took some thinking from Amartya Sen, um, who was very interested in the concept of what he called capabilities and functions. So basically, capabilities is what you could do, and function is what you actually get to do. And um, the, the concept of turning that around, so what capabilities does the environment require me to have in order to enjoy it? And then I arrive with a set of capabilities which will enable me to enjoy it or not, depending on how my capabilities uh, in, interact with those of the the required ones of the environment. So by looking at what those capabilities are, can I lift my foot up enough? Can I see something? Can I, do I understand the color? How do I appreciate the sound and so on? Um, these are all things that I can, I can work with. And that gives us the ability to start to tweak these things. So to get a, an environment to be more personable, do I change the environment or do I change the capabilities of the person? I wear glasses, okay? So I change my capabilities. So you can, if you had to design everything for me without glasses, it would be a rather strange world. So there are, there are steps I can take that will change those capabilities. Equally, you can, you can look at the environment and say, well, actually, we can make this a lot better for more people if we did something to the environment. So you can, you can play around with, with both and, and how that gets, uh, what that balance is, is actually quite important. And then that then says, well, how do I know when I'm talking about environments and things, how do I know that I've actually dealing with the right capabilities, well, that's what we have senses for. And the senses are essentially the pathways by which the environment talks to us um, in, our, in our model. And um, we work with many more than the five traditional senses. So we um, have all sorts of different sorts of senses that we uh, use. We don't, I'm not going to go into those this afternoon because we don't have a lot of time. But the idea is that those senses, so how do we manage those senses? How, how does vision work? How does it interact with hearing? If I, if I change uh, the lighting, for example, what happens to my hearing? If I change my hearing, what I'm hearing, how does it change what I smell or what I taste? Um, those sorts of interactions. And in order to be able to bring that sense of the senses, which is, how we are, which is our communication pathway with the environment, into how we actually design um, some sort of public space, we need to understand what the underlying science is to do that. And that's where the interaction with neuroscience comes in. Because at the end of all this, we've got stuff coming into our, through our sensory pathways into our brain, and then our response comes out of the brain and goes out. So the key element of this is what goes on in the brain, which I know nothing about. So but that's, that's the sort of general idea. So to find out how we do all this, um, I built a laboratory. Um, <laughs> And the laboratory is called Pamela, uh, which causes me an awful lot of grief. So um, Pamela is not a person. Um, <laughs> Pamela um, is an acronym, and uh, it stands for Pedestrian Accessibility Movement Environment Laboratory. Um, and it's a sort of big shed. And in that big shed, we have a physical floor that we can bend and we can change and put slopes in and make, change its shape and change its materials, um, do all sorts of stuff with the floor. Um, and then we can do things like make a railway station. So this is some work we did for London Underground. And we build a tube train. They want to know how to design their new tube trains. First time in 150 years they've done that by thinking about people before the diameter of the wheels. And um, what we're doing here is essentially testing the design about people getting on and off that train. So these fortunate people came to get on and off a train about 450 times in a three weeks. Um, <laughs> And we could see what happens when we change the seating, when we change the doors, when we change the poles, when we change the lighting of the station, so on. What happens to people when they get on and off tube trains? And we can, that has actually changed the design of trains. When that train rolls out, you'll see it will be very different. Um, but also we can play with the lighting. So, so um, this is just a thing. We have um, a large uh, LED 
lighting array, so we can actually program any color of lighting and or any intensity up to um, about 15,000 lux if I, if I look at the floor, which is you wouldn't want to look at the floor if it's at 15,000 lux. So, they are, so that's partly because we work with ophthalmologists who are interested in glare. And so we can actually make an environment. We can also make a sound environment. In, in the laboratory, we can fly aircraft through it and things like that uh, acoustically. We can make wonderful explosions and stuff. Um, this is a, one of the outputs of that, <laughs> which is a map um, of the underground, which we, we had on Regent Street uh, last year. And that map is a, essentially a slightly stylized version of the London underground. And what, we're, uh, what we do on that is that there are various points in that where city sounds are reproduced. So if you stand in a certain place, it will produce Big Ben. Or if you stand in Greenwich, it will produce a clock. If you stand somewhere else, it will produce a tube train and so on. And we commissioned a bunch of dancers to dance on that, which is quite a challenge for them. But what that's about is actually trying to get people to realize that sounds aren't necessarily evil things. Maybe we actually need, need to have a bit more thinking about how we do sounds, how we reproduce them, how do we look after them in the environment. We also have a bus. Um, and we do, we've done a lot of work with people moving around moving buses. How do you actually sense acceleration and deceleration? How do you adjust for that at the age of 16? How do you adjust for the age of 60? It's quite different. And nobody really understands that because they can't make the science behind all that is actually really quite difficult because the bus is moving. So we can do all that sort of stuff. And that's basically the sort of thing that Pamela does. And we did some work um, over the platform height between the train and the platform. Uh, why is it when they made the new circle line trains that more people tripped over as they got in the train than when you had a big step? And that's all to do with the way people see and the way that vision works. Um, and so we can actually, we looked at that sort of process. So you can see that it's a kind of environment where we can, where we can play uh, with things. This is a profile of how people get on and off a tube train. The red is getting off and the blue is getting on. And you can see there, roughly speaking, you, this was a particular setup where we had 20 people getting on, 20 people getting off, and that took 40 seconds. Um, London Underground doesn't have 20, 40 seconds to do that, so they want to shut the doors at 27 seconds. So if you shut the doors at 20 seconds, uh, 27 seconds, you will get 20 alighting because they get off first, and then 15 boarding. So that gives us a problem. The problem is, how do we get, stop those remaining people from get, trying to get on the train? Because that will delay the train. So we have to convince them, um, essentially, uh, that the next train actually really is coming. You know, it's going to be very soon. Um, and and it, yes, uh, where is this information? Is it in my ears? Is it in front of me? Is it on the end of the platform? How do I actually know this? And so that means if we want to do this, we've actually got to do something about bringing the trains much, much closer together. That means reforming the way we signal railways. So we have to change the philosophy of signaling. We have to think very, very much more about um, how we actually do that so we get a better and more civilized journey. So the connection between our senses and our, and our um, interaction with that space, whether it is a square or a street or a corner or a station or a train, actually is all about how we understand the interaction of the senses, the brain, and the environment around us. <laughs>